Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joel Hewitt, and I'm a subject matter expert here at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. We are pleased to present today's webinar on innovative attachment systems for improved performance of prosthetics and exoskeletons. So first, please note that copies of the slides will be available for download at the end of the presentation, uh, and also will be posted on our website soon. We're also recording the webinar, and the video webcast will be available online as well. The chat box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen is enabled, so please ask any questions that you may have. Our presenter will either answer them as we go or answer them at the end. So we are a Department of Defense-sponsored entity, one of three Information Analysis Centers, or IACs. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is simple, to be the go-to R&D, S&T, and RDT&E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security communities. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and high-quality products to the DoD and HDS COIs and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing the government. We pursue this mission across eight focus areas, alternative energy, biometrics, CBRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural studies, homeland defense, medical, and weapons of mass destruction. Our network of subject matter experts is a central tool in achieving this mission. If you have expertise in one or more of our focus areas, we invite you to apply. Our SMEs help us provide the military and government with the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovations. Our speaker today, Randy Alley, is an excellent example of a SME who we collaborate with and turn to for technical advice. So before I introduce Randy further, I wanted to take a few minutes to introduce today's topic and its relevance and importance to the Department of Defense. As we note here, DOD and the Department of Veterans Affairs have long been involved in prosthetics development. In 1921, the VA first became responsible for providing artificial limbs to World War I veterans, and that practice continues today. In the modern period, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan have led to traumatic amputations in approximately 1,700 service members. The challenges posed by these and future injuries prompt today's discussion. As you can see from the list, DOD and VA programs and facilities have provided extensive support in designing, developing, testing, and distributing prosthetic devices and in funding new R&D initiatives. These efforts have culminated in some of the most advanced prosthetic limbs ever developed. This list includes the Life Under Kinetic Evolution Arm, also known as the Luke Arm System, named after Luke Skywalker, who of course suffers a traumatic amputation and receives an advanced prosthetic hand in the Star Wars franchise. As the nature of both rehabilitation and combat continue to evolve, we have seen the development of a new type of prosthetic the exoskeleton. Now, exoskeletons are not typically understood as being a type of prosthetic, but this is a classification that is in a period of rapid flux. After all, the root meaning of the word prosthetic is much closer to the idea of addition than it is of replacement. While the examples of advanced limb and exoskeleton prosthetics listed on the screen here are extremely complex, Challenges remain regarding means of seamlessly integrating these devices with a human operator and means of facilitating more natural movement between them. Hence, the importance of today's topic and why we are honored to have our speaker. Mr. Randy Alley is the CEO of Biodesign Incorporated. He's the inventor of the high fidelity interface system and the motion capturing fast access osteostabilizing limb exoskeleton. Randy was a key consultant on the Luke Arm project that I mentioned earlier, and is the recipient of numerous awards, including a U.S. Army Certificate of Appreciation and an IEEE Design Award. He holds a bachelor's degree from UCLA and has a lot of experience in this field, 
Randy, we are extremely pleased to host you, and we'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Joel. Thanks to everyone at HDIAC. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I spoke down in San Diego a few days ago. Uh, the same presentation, however, covered in a little bit shorter time, so we should have ample time for interactivity and questions. What I'll probably do is save the questions until I'm done, and they'll be um, managed and handled on screen, and so we can uh, talk about them afterward. So first, I want to start off with a fairly bold statement, and that is the human interface has been an afterthought. And what I mean by this is that there have been a lot of excitement regarding um, gear and components, actuators, um, things like feet and knees on, in prosthetics. And all of the attention really has been garnered by these types of components because, let's face it, they're incredibly engineered and exciting to learn about. Uh, we've come a long way since, um, you know, mechanical knees. The issue, though, is what has been left behind is the interface itself, the human connection to these devices. What I call a peripheral approach really is the world industry standard for attaching just about anything to the human limb. And what I mean by that is it's, it's really when you take an arm or a leg and you attempt to attach something to it, the go-to philosophy is wrap around the limb in a circumferential manner with Velcro straps, with cuffs, with brace designs. And the problem with this is that if you're just going to do that, you're, you're always going to be plagued by simplistic, inferior biomechanics. If you look at the world of prosthetics, which is where I'm originally from, the standard approach is, is just simple capture of the limb. And if you look at this image, what you see is a little bit of modifications going on at the proximal brim area. But apart from that, it's, it's almost a conformance to limb shape is about as far as it goes. The only thing prosthetists tend to do is remove a little bit of volume from the limb itself in terms of the limb shape, the data captured from the limb, not the actual limb itself. I think patients are probably a little upset about that. But from the socket itself, they actually reduce the volume slightly so that it can stay on. And the other uh, parameter is just thinking about comfort. So unfortunately, the threshold for interface success in prosthetics is, is it comfortable and does it stay on? My point is, those should be a given. It should stay on and it should be comfortable. So what do we want beyond that? But before we get into that, let's look at some of the other fields. So in orthotics, it's much the same thing. We have this circumferential approach to attaching to a limb because what, you know, what else is there in our minds? Same thing with orthopedics. A traditional fracture management strategy uses the same primitive approach that we do in prosthetics, orthotics, basically creating a circumferential tube in which to control the joints and which to provide hydrostatic pressure to the soft tissues inside. Now, the problem with that is this greatly affects healing time. So just because we've immobilized the joints, every time I move with a cast on, what's going to happen is that, that bo where that bone fracture is, that's going to translate within the cast, okay, within the soft tissue. And that's what, in our minds, increases healing times. And so some people point out that, well, when it, when it heals, it heals stronger uh, at that fracture site. Well, that's not what you want. You don't want a lopsided strength within a bone. It's engineered a certain way. And what you really want is a uniform structure that is aligned appropriately. So you want that bone to lay down in line with the rest of the shaft. And there are ways to do a much better job than what we do now. But for the time being, the circumferential approach is ubiquitous uh, in the field. Same with multi-million dollar and even billion dollar exoskeletons. So they spend all of this engineering resources on the actuators or the joints or the software and algorithms 
and they wonder why they're getting issues with patient acceptance or it doesn't feel natural to them or it feels heavy or it feels unstable or we're getting backlash in our joints. What's going on? Let's, let's work on creating better joint direct uh, pathways, right? The problem I can tell you, a big part of the problem is that it's how it's attached. So when the individual moves, the first thing that's going to happen is that cuff strap's going to sink into the flesh. If you add more weight and power to the system, it only exacerbates the problem. Same thing with wearable tech. So we have the same approach again. Sometimes we get lucky where the item is so light that circumferential attachment is okay. But if you've noticed anyone in the gym with their phones, very few people are wearing the device I'm showing here. There are a couple of them. And that's because even though it does the job, it rotates, it wobbles, it doesn't feel real good. And it's encased in a plastic sheath. Same with displays in military. They, they wobble when you go to move. It's just not a great way to attach anything of significant mass to the extremities. And herein lies the problem. If you take a cross section, and you take this circumferential approach, it's inherently unstable because it's impossible to squeeze tight enough without becoming a tourniquet to sufficiently control the primary mover, which is the skeleton. So in prosthetics, orthotics, we pay attention in exoskeletons, we pay attention not to the skeletal structure, but to the limb as a whole. So we are looking at accommodating the soft tissue and what happens is you end up with this flexible, mobile medium that the brace is supposed to stabilize itself on or the prosthesis. And that's a tough job. You're going to have a ton of motion of the device relative to the skeleton, which is exactly what you don't want. So in a nutshell, the fundamental principles of traditional human attachment exert too little influence on the underlying bone. They just aren't biomechanically efficient, but there's a lot more to it than that. Not only do they not maximize human function, but they can also create degradation as the sound side attempts to make up or take up the slack. So when it comes to attaching things to the human body, especially on the extremities, we can do better. I think it's fairly obvious that if we focus on capturing, controlling, and connecting to the underlying bone, uh, we're, we're taking the right direction in terms of stability and device function. And here's a great example. In, in prosthetics, um, you know, we're looking at the cross-section of the thigh here. Now, in an able-bodied individual, muscle tone is far superior to the tone that is available in an amputated uh, limb, right? The, the remaining limb after amputation. And so this whole problem is even exacerbated in, in prosthetics because those muscles that you see uh, are, are much softer, more pliable, therefore much more mobile. Therefore, ultimately, the device is far more unstable. The question is, is how do we, how do we capture and control the underlying skeleton? And you probably know where I'm going with this. So one approach is osteointegration which is a direct surgical connection. Now, right off the bat, the biggest problem we have is that the greatest population of amputees are dysvascular, and osseointegration is currently contraindicated for that. You also have a 100% infection rate. Now, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I won't name names, but there was an osseointegration doc who decided to reclassify what an actual infection is, and he based it on the a threshold of how many white blood cells were present. And so suddenly now we don't have 100% infection. However, uh, most folks will agree that it's there. It's just been, um, the definition of it has been altered. The other thing with osteointegration is it's getting a lot of press. You're seeing it everywhere. And that's because it's exciting. It's a new frontier, but it's expensive. And let's face it, it's invasive surgery. The other issue is, is as techniques evolve, it's a little hard for someone who's already had you know, osteointegration to necessarily update with new technology that may be far superior. Most importantly though, 
when I see soldiers getting osteointegration, soldiers with beautiful, long, strong limbs, uh, I have to wonder, is it because they've been told that prosthetic interfaces just don't work? Which I have to agree, traditional prosthetic interfaces are not very good. But I'd like to see a, a, a higher threshold for going into something like this because ultimately they still don't know how osteointegration is gonna fare in terms of very high activity levels. So you're taking this young soldier who wants to get back out there in the mix and uh, asking them, hey, take it easy. Well, that, that's not exactly a, a great thing for them to hear, nor will they necessarily adhere to that request. And finally, dirty water is always gonna be a problem with an open wound. So they're, they're working on improving osteointegration, but I think it's a radical step and should be reserved for those folks with very short limbs that just can't tolerate an advanced interface. So what's the alternative solution? So this is normally a video, but to, to save lag times and things, we just broke it up into a couple of screenshots. So this is the Luke Arm Generation 2. This woman has a four inch long humerus and she's lifting about nine pounds. And as you can tell, uh, this is non-surgically attached. This is utilizing what I call osteostabilization as an approach to attaching to the limb. And she's lifting this device, and you can tell on the far right picture, she's got full skeletal range of motion. She could lift this directly over her head. And it's comfortable, and it's not impinging on the bone. In a traditional socket, what would happen is that humerus, the bone inside the arm, would engage with the interface wall as they tried to lift up with this much weight on there. And most likely it would impact in an uncomfortable fashion and this person would be lifting with the end of their humerus. And a lot of her range of motion would be eaten up inside the interface itself before anything starts moving. And that's a killer to an upper limb amputee who really needs all the functional range of motion they can possibly get. What's nice about this is it doesn't require surgery and there are no known contraindications. There's a wide range of compression that we do and I'll get more into detail on that. So in a nutshell, essentially all we're doing is we're creating an alternating array of compression and tissue release. Compression does not have to be excessive. It merely has to pack in denser tissue around the bone shaft such that the entire complex, the underlying shaft of the bone and the dense matrix of tissue around it can't sneak in between the compression zones. So what you have is a far more efficient force transfer or energy transfer. You have much greater stability. You have much better rotational control and you maximize your range of motion. And, and the great serendipitous thing we found with a lot of severe diabetic lower limb patients was that it actually improves deep venous return. And so we had um, some great results in the UK with a study of 15 severely diabetic individuals with bright red distal ends, even though they were making full contact in their prosthetic interfaces. And in two weeks, they had sent me pictures and they had all cleared up. Uh, really quite fascinating to see. Perfusion was my greatest concern. But one of the things we found out during the Luke Arm project was that the body tends to compensate in compressed areas by shoving more blood into that, that area over time. And so when we started off with an incredibly aggressive interface, trying to self-suspend the Luke arm on a very short humerus, just to see if we could do it, uh, we saw some you know, hyperemia that lasted longer than we would have liked to have seen initially on day one. Day two, day three, day four brought subsequent reductions of the, the time hyperemia uh, lasted. And so eventually it normalized. And yet we had an incredibly aggressive interface. So these are things that the body can do and things that we've studied very carefully in terms of how you release the tissue from outside a compression zone. You can't just do it abruptly. You have to do it slowly and carefully. And this is sort of what we've been working on over the decade. So again, this is typically a movie clip, but this gives you a good idea essentially of what we're trying to do.
So in, in frame number two, you can see that what we've done is we've created this dense core tissue around the bone, and now in any direction the bone attempts to move, it's bringing along with it this dense core of tissue. And so we don't completely immobilize the bone inside. That would require massive amounts of compression. We mitigate the motion significantly. We also must think not just about motion, but also about impact forces acting from the outside. So stability, um, rotational forces, ground reaction forces. Uh, think of an exoskeleton that's powered. Think of first trying to move the system, say the TALO system, which is 400 pounds. Trying to move that system, having it fight, and fight against you, and then as power kicks in, having it push against your limb. And you can imagine that if you don't have some type of very stable attachment, it's going to rock back and forth and feel like the entire system is fighting you. And it will feel much heavier than it actually is, even though 400 pounds is enough. So in this, in this screenshot um, series, what we're trying to show is on the left is a non-osseostabilized femur. Now, this would be typical of a traditional prosthetic approach. And imagine this not occurring just in 2D, but in 3D. So that bone shaft is moving all over the place inside. Now, that's, that's not only unstable, that's wasted motion and energy. We already know, for example, that amputees expend quite a bit much more energy during gait than we do with, with, uh, with our sound legs. It's not just the components. So the entire industry focused on energy storing feet and uh, powered ankles, for example. No one paid attention to the fact that maybe we're losing energy in the interface, which we surely are, uh, probably 15 to 20% in some of these designs. So while there's still some movement on the right, it's hard to see, it displaces slightly, it doesn't move very much at all. And this, this bodes very well for one of the most important up and coming characteristics that we are facing in prosthetics, which is two things actually. One is gait symmetry. Now, for those of you in the know, uh, asymmetrical gait really breaks down the body's joints and tissues over time. So that what happens is the sound leg, if there is one, has to compensate and it ends up pounding into the ground harder or staying on it longer or pushing off to raise the prosthesis off the ground. These are all things that create uh, a degradation of soft tissue and joint structures over time for the amputee. And the, the surest way to uh, shorten lifespan in an amputee is to take them from a highly mobile situation to a sedentary one. And so the actual life expectancy of a transfemoral amputee is about six years after amputation. Much of this, of course, is that most of them are dysvascular, but a significant amount, which has been largely ignored, are the result of, of this sound side breakdown and this transition from mobility to immobility. Here's another example of, of what's kind of neat about osteosynchronization and osteostabilization. So osteostabilization is the act of stabilizing the bone. Osteosynchronization is the actual device that is attached becomes synchronized with the motion of the skeleton and not the soft tissue surrounding the limb. This is very key. So if you look at these two data uh, examples, what you have is if you focus on the green band on the left and on the right, the left side represents what is thought to have been the cutting edge, state-of-the-art interface and suspension design, which is a subischial below the ischium, elevated vacuum and Hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars have been spent on, on elevated vacuum. It's the end all be all for many manufacturers in their minds. Uh, and then you compare on the right, what we call a high fidelity interface, which is an osseostabilized interface using a much more basic uh, suspension system, simply an expulsion valve, a skin fit expulsion valve. And look how narrow the band is which represents same side step uniformity or step variability, depending on how you want to look at it. So the, the wider that band is, the more unlike the predecessor and the successors are to that particular step. And so, and, and you can imagine if the brain's having to guess where to plant the prosthesis, 
on the ground with the bone floating inside the socket in space, you can imagine that it's going to vary, vary quite a bit. However, if the brain can sense that things are moving along as they used to, it's going to get pretty good at accurately placing the foot. And that's huge when it comes to gait symmetry. So this direct linkage uh, and the proprioception and even osseoperception we get. So osseointegration uh, folks aren't the only ones that get osseoperception. Because we get closer to the bone, we also, our, our, our subjects also gain the benefits of osseoperception. Here's an example of a ground force uh, plot in the Z direction, meaning what they're essentially doing is a typical uh, force plot of pushing a heel strike and then the second hump there is the what we call the propulsive hump in gait analysis. And with a traditional design, it was very easy to see that you had this plateau where you shouldn't have it. And this turns out to be exactly the moment when you're starting to load the foot, the femur reacts by, you know, least resistance, moving backward. And a lot of the power of the amputee is lost within the socket itself. And in fact, when we did a study of net breaking versus net propulsion, it was discovered that traditional sockets overall have a net breaking effect to the amputee, meaning the sound side or the contralateral side has to make up for that deficit by adding more propulsion into the system. And this is not a good thing to do to somebody. When you look at ours, we have a net propulsion. And so that's very nearly a normal gait pattern when you look at how you stabilize the bone, transfer that energy down, it's acting a lot more like what was lost. And that's what we're trying to pursue. So in terms of the exoskeleton, we can do a lot better. Um, one of the things we can look at is some of these heavier exoskeletons that were abandoned. Maybe they were abandoned for reasons unbeknownst to the individuals. Maybe it was the attachment mechanism itself. Maybe we can look back at some of these heavier powered exoskeletons and reimagine them with a better attachment and maybe they might just perform a bit better and maybe up to even an acceptable standard for the operator. What we do know is if we radically improve the attachment, we should be able to make it less complex. And what I mean by that is maybe we don't have to have the most impressive algorithms uh, and or actuators and joint designs when the interface is stable and performing appropriately. This should also ultimately uh, result in reduced cost, being more energy efficient while they're walking, certainly enhanced weight tolerance. So what we find is that perceived weight of something is a lot more important than you might think. Just because something weighs 10 pounds, if it's flopping around on your arm, it may feel like it weighs 20 or 30 pounds because it's moving in an opposite direction almost when you initiate movement. And so this should really radically affect interface acceptance as well. Finally, probably the most serendipitous of all for us after doing this for 10 years was that in talking to neuroscientists, um, they all tend to, to basically agree that if you can mimic, <coughs> excuse me, if you can mimic the, the motion of the, of the skeleton in any device that's being worn, the brain can be fooled into thinking that its arm or leg is back, right? And if you're wearing a brace or you're wearing an exoskeleton, it can be fooled into believing that this particular device is embodied or a part of you. What that means is the soldier out there can then forget about the distraction of the device itself and focus on their mission. They can forget they're wearing anything at all. And really interesting is that and we'll look into this with a functional MRI at some point. But the thought that these neural networks that were atrophying because the brain was saying, oh, okay, this is obviously a pendulum swinging on the end of my body. It doesn't really exist in, in nature, didn't exist before. So it's very noticeable to me. But all of a sudden, if something starts moving like it used to, then all of a sudden those muscles start firing like they used to. Those nerves tend to reach out and, and maybe grow just a little bit uh, and try to approach what they used to have. So I think this embodiment 
is really the ultimate goal for us, no matter what the device is. If we can really take the leap towards creating a, this skeletally synchronized device, whether it's an exoskeleton or a brace or a prosthesis, then we'll come a long ways towards maybe simplifying the need for all of these sensors and and technology that has to assist an individual. And maybe we can get back to the basics of creating superior biomechanical designs that don't require as much complexity. Okay, that is it for me. All right, Randy, Any that's what questions. Is dumb. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Uh, go right ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. So uh, Barrett's asking, does the bone float? Um, does that be, is that minimized by the four-point compression of the interface? It's, it's a great question. So interestingly enough, when we looked at this, um, we, we initially started with upper limb. And when I thought, my gosh, bone control is really quite amazing. How will it work at the lower limb? I thought, man, you know, what structures are going to be in the way? And when I initially designed the, the imaging stand, we call it, that actually imparts these compression zones, my first thought was, I need to capture this 3D limb in space. And so I need to provide as much motion as possible to the paddles themselves and, and be able to put those paddles wherever I can, depending on the person's anatomy. And what we quickly found out is that the optimum placement is using four and not three because with three you end up cutting right through some major uh, musculature and essentially by having four offset um, away from the quads away from the hamstrings away from the adductors and transfemoral for example you end up covering the least amount of musculature because remember in an amputated limb the muscles are much more mobile they're also attached to the distal end so they converge differently than they do in a, in a sound limb. So when you have these, these pliable, soft structures, we can pretty much shape them however we want. What we want to do, though, however, is cross as little muscle mass as we can so we don't restrict that, that musculature from working. And it turns out that four is the right amount to allow enough tissue release and the right width of the struts themselves or compression areas to allow superior control, superior comfort. And this leads into the next question, can it help with vertical impact? And this is really a great question because absolutely, in fact, we don't use ischial support. For those of you not familiar in prosthetics, the, the standard of care is creating a seat for the ischium to sit into. And what this does is that heel strike the person literally is sitting on a shelf. And while this sounds wonderful, the problem with it is, is it weakens the musculature of the hip over time. And so you end up with a lax hip, hip joint, which is exactly what an amputee doesn't need. However, this hasn't really been um, recognized as a serious problem yet. And I'm doing my darndest to make people recognize that. So what we use is a subiscule design. We're essentially holding the limb up with four hands. Uh, circumferentially arrayed around the limb and we can precisely control the distal end pressure depending on the compression levels and the shape of the compression units. So hopefully that uh, helps. And can you speak about how the interfaces could alleviate spinal compression by redistributing the weight? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that happen um, not just with amputees but with, with brace wearers and exoskeleton wearers. And the problem is, is that you tend to favor uh, the sound side if you have one, right? And you do that because you don't really trust the device. Um, and so this is a subconscious thing. So you have these patients walking and they lean way over to one side to get directly over the prosthesis. And then they come back to the other direction. They stay on their sound side a lot longer. The stride length on their prosthetic side is much longer because they're staying on the sound side and swinging that prosthesis through the air um, and trying to get over that prosthesis as fast as they can to get back to the same side, uh, to, sorry, to the sound side. And so all of this compensation results in a variety of soft tissue damage, including spinal compression. All of these things um, tend to create, anytime you get out of a normal gait pattern, that's where compensation comes into effect. 
And while muscular compensation sometimes is a good thing, as in the gym, uh, joint compensation is typically not a good thing. So uh, the next question in regards to circulation. So, so this is a great question. This was my biggest concern uh, when, I, when I created this design. And so we went after probably the worst case scenarios of heavily compromised circulation. And the nice thing about this design is it's not a one size fits all. So the amount of compression you do can be varied significantly. So imagine you have a, what we call a bucket and you have a, the limb inside the bucket, and you simply press in very gently, longitudinally along these areas. You actually have less compression in these, com in these compression areas than you do in an ischial seat, for example, or at the proximal brim of a traditional design. The pressures at the proximal brim of a traditional design are pretty severe because they're trying to get all of their control at this proximal area of the limb. For some reason, the shaft of the bone has been completely ignored. And so what happens is they're strangling the limb at the proximal end. They're trying to get stability by essentially holding on to the last inch of a, of a rake handle instead of reaching farther down the shaft of the handle, which is what this, this osteostabilization idea does. And so you end up with compromised circulation proximally, whereas with us, we can have a much gentler proximal brim because all we're doing is receiving the soft tissue. We're not relying on the proximal brim for control. Where we're getting all of our control is distally along the entire shaft of the limb and even beyond, sorry, the shaft of the bone, and even beyond the shaft of the bone into the soft tissue. This is really important because when people have redundant soft tissue below the shaft of their bone, that becomes a very useless cushion that gets very mobile if it's excessive, so two, three, four inches. What we can do by carrying these compression zones farther down into that soft tissue is make it denser. So the disparity between the dense bone and the soft tissue becomes less. We've actually had reports of the patient feeling a longer lever arm because of that. So uh, quite interesting stuff. So it, it does impact circulation. It actually improves circulation. It, it does it in two ways. It improves deep venous return, much as a compression sock would, but it also, gives them uh, typically raises their activity level so that they get up and about um, a little bit more and that's what we found with these patients in the UK is they were actually more active because they trusted their prosthesis more and that also helped with the muscle pumps okay next question well proceed weight of the prosthetic is less due to the compression of the bone does the increased weight have an effect on joint movement and feeling weight effect affection joint movement speed etc yeah so we're not um, advocating for heavier anything. Um, the issue is, is that when more complex components come along, and they ultimately do because we're striving to replace the human limb, so in order to do that, we're going to have you know, heavy battery-powered systems typically uh, bearing the brunt of that responsibility. You end up with very heavy devices that are really felt during the swing phase in an amputee. And so not only do you have this sudden um, launching at toe off and the device is, you know, feels like it's moving the other direction as you bring your thigh forward, but now you're trying to break all of these components as you swing through the air, break as in B-R-A-K-E. And as you come to a stop just prior to heel strike in a traditional design, your bone is literally flying through the medium inside the socket. And with, with an osteostabilized design, accelerations in braking are much more direct and efficient. So you'll have this better feeling of less perceived weight, but in addition, you'll have less stress on the joints because you won't have this sudden um, uh, breakaway, so to speak, of forces where the, the bone is moving through the medium and then suddenly it hits the wall of the socket and you have a rapid breaking instead of a controlled breaking, for example. So those are just some of the ways that the joints themselves will be affected. But for sure, the heavier we go. And, and there's, there's also the wrong direction. We've, we've made prostheses too light, right? And not just the weight, but also weight distribution. These are all very critical. So having a very lightweight prosthesis can work against you when you're swinging through the air because the wind can affect it, believe it or not. We've had you know, two and three pound transfemoral devices attached thinking we've, we've, we've met the holy grail and the person's 
unable to swing smoothly. You do need some pendulum effect with some mass uh, to swing smoothly through the air. Um, so those are our ways we look at. But then the weight distribution itself can be affected such that you want to try to mimic what we have now, but typically most of the weight is at the knee and at the foot ankle complex, as you might imagine. Okay, so insurance coverage. Now, this is a great question regarding the FDA. So up until just recently, all prosthetic devices were class one exempt. And I will say that the Luke arm really caused the issue to come to the forefront with the FDA. So initially the Luke arm would have come out five years earlier, but there was an incredible battle with the FDA because they wanted to call it a class two device. And DECA was arguing that, you know, this is not a class two device, it's a prosthesis just like any other prosthesis, just because it has more degrees of freedom uh, doesn't mean that it should suddenly become a class two. And the issue was that they got in such heated arguments that the FDA then declared it de novo, which is the absolute worst classification that any manufacturer could receive. Because then it's uh, now I've got to spend millions and millions of dollars to prove to you that this is safe. And in the end, it was down, then rendered to a class two, but it, um, it took five years of delays to do that. So it's really kind of sad that it's only just come out a year ago. Um, it was officially recognized by the FDA in 2014 as marketable, but it really only came out last year uh, as a commercial product. And so a lot of years were lost on that. Um, insurance coverage. Now, insurance coverage, I'm in California, which has got to be some of the worst insurance in the land. And um, it's, it's really gotten bad. I mean, <clears throat> Medicare used to be the bottom standard for us. Uh, when, when we had Medicare contracts, we used to groan and complain. Now we're seeing contracts here in the States, uh, here in uh, California, as low as 30% of Medicare, not 30% off Medicare, but 30% of Medicare. So you have all these insurance plans that are actually paying for less than the wholesale cost to us of the components. So you can imagine that's not going to keep very many people afloat for very long. So the idea then is for us to um, fight back against that with greater functional outcomes. And one of the things I love about the interface is it's a really low cost approach to greatly improving any prosthetic, orthotic, orthopedic, or exoskeletal system. And you don't need a degree in engineering to create an interface. It's a technique, it's a method. And um, although there's some secret sauce involved, that's why we license the technology. We just want people to be safe and safely apply it. And so we're expanding this out to other areas outside of prosthetics because we believe that if you have a good interface, it's based on a biomechanical uh, design that doesn't require a lot of complexity, then you've got a winner on your hands in terms of, of reducing the ultimate cost of any device uh, that is attached to the individual. Hopefully I answered your question there, Eric. Um, Peter asks, does the person with one or more amputated finger digits have to get a Luke arm in order to restore foot function? No, it, this is the nice thing. The Luke arm, it's, real, it's claim to fame, in my mind, is a fully articulating shoulder. So shoulder amputees have had to really suffer over the years. We've had nothing but passive shoulder joints and, you know, they basically relegate themselves to a frontal functional envelope um, in a very small area because it's just a pain in the butt to unlock a shoulder joint then lean forward at the waist and let the uh, shoulder joint swing forward and then lock it again and stand up just to reach over your head. So the really game changer for the Luke arm is the articulating shoulder, the external humeral, sorry, the humeral rotation, and also end point control. Now end point control is probably the most exciting because you have 10 degrees of freedom in the Luke arm. If you were to try to control this with electrodes, for example, or pattern recognition, it would be a nightmare to control each individual degree of freedom with volitional thought. So what they did was they took a series of um, measurements and, and uh, data from the joints when a person reached out to their side, in front of them or above their head, and they basically said, look, 95% of the time, my joints are going to be ar arranged in this manner. So I'm not going to rotate my elbow towards the sky when I go to reach out above my head. I'm going to just reach straight up. And so they were able to have the joints in effect automatically configure themselves in space as the person was just thinking about their prehensor, their endpoint, their hand. So 
What's really nice about the system is the person just thinks hand up, hand down, hand forward, hand back, hand left, right, and that's it. The joints do the rest. So pretty neat. So you certainly don't need the Luke arm. Uh, there are powered digits now. We never used to have powered prosthetic digits. We now have those. There are passive mechanical digits for individuals with partial hand injuries. Um, these are all um, coming along very quickly and are some are very sophisticated. Uh, but we always caution someone who has partial fingers that proprioception is a wonderful thing to have. And so covering that up, if you can get by without doing something, uh, should be a default unless you're going to put the other joints at risk from overuse. So these are all things we weigh in the prosthetic industry. Okay, so congenital amputees. Yeah, so, so this is really interesting. And it's not just, it's not just um, congenital, it's also individuals who have never had a traditional prosthesis. These are the ones that I'll never be able to really convey what the differences are unless I were to take the time to make a traditional socket for them. So uh, with congenital amputees, we, we have to, and you know, congenital amputee, uh, limb deficient, there's a lot of different names uh, for them. Uh, I want to be correct in how we describe them, but essentially the um, limb amelia they're faced with is not unlike a traditional amputated limb with the exception that the muscles may be attached differently. Um, when it comes to sensing the prosthesis, the advantage we have is that we mimic skeletal motion, um, and when I say we, the, the osseostabilizing interface, I should say, mimics skeletal motion far more accurately than any other type of interface will. And so right then and there, uh, their comparison is, their, say, their opposite arm. Uh, their comparison is uh, stability. It's not necessarily rooted in how this compares to a traditional design. So it works for either, it's just not quite the shocking result uh, to those who've never worn a prosthesis or to congenital uh, limb amelia patients um, as it is with someone with, with an amputation. Randy, so I just wanted to um, second Matt's question from earlier on how the, the design may perform when submerged or um, you know partially submerged. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm sorry, I didn't get to, didn't get that done. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, in terms of submerged in water, this is great because one of the things that uh, we do a lot of are what we call what I call adaptive um, prostheses, and and you know the typical industry buzzword is is activity specific, and I don't like that because with a simple switch of a terminal device, you're often doing something else, like going from swimming to riding a bike, for example. So. We, we love to have highly adaptive systems. And uh, in the interface side of the equation, water is very similar to sweat in terms of it makes things slip on the skin, as you might imagine, which is probably why you're asking the question. The beautiful thing about this design, though, is that it not only increases surface friction, so it will behave better underwater than a traditional design, but when you release the tissue, remember we have an alternating array of compression and release. When you release the tissue, that creates what I'll call a topographical um, height, essentially, that we can suspend off of. So if you imagine this bulging tissue coming out of this interface, we can actually grab onto the top of it and, and prevent the interface from slipping down. So underwater doesn't affect us nearly as much as other systems because we rely on greater surface tension and friction but also the shape of the limb works to our advantage. So we can grab, in fact, a really great way to discuss this is there are pin suspensions um, mechanisms in liners, silicone roll-up liners or urethane roll-up liners that have a distal pin in them. And those engage with a lock at the distal end of the prosthesis. These were somewhat abandoned uh, by a lot of prosthetists because of the distal end problems they were having. So you can imagine this stretchy silicone liner, even with a matrix in it, it still stretches and compresses. During swing phase, when I lift up, when I'm wearing the prosthesis and the pin is engaged in the bottom of the socket, the silicone or urethane liner tends to compress the distal end and what we call milking the distal end tissue. So it starts to suck more and more fluid with each step down into the distal end. And this can be incredibly uncomfortable 
uh, for the wear. And so a lot of folks said, hey, I don't want to just have suspension at the distal end of my prosthesis. I'm going to abandon this type of suspension. I'll still use liners, but I may use a, a, a seal around the mid shaft, for example, that seals with the socket. Or I may go to elevated vacuum instead of a pin suspension. What we found is we're able to use pin, suspe uh, pin suspension without having any distal end problems because of what I just described. We get our primary suspension over and above the released soft tissue. The pin becomes a secondary suspension, so we don't have that distal stretching and pulling uh, as you would in a traditional design. And hopefully that answers your question. And, and keep in mind, you can, any of you can uh, contact me uh, with further questions if you, you don't get a chance to get them in today. Yeah, I had two short questions. Um, one was whether you've had better success or whether uh, osteostabilization is better suited to uh, either arm amputations or leg amputations. And then also, is there any data on the maximum amount of time a wearer can you know, be engaged with this without uh, you know, fatigue or, or essentially needing to take it off and rest? Sure, sure. So it originally started as an upper limb project, as I stated earlier, and um, the big concern for me was how well would this translate given the anatomy, given the weight-bearing environment uh, in lower limb. Now, upper limb has weight-bearing as well. People tend to, to ignore this fact, but uh, a lot of times an upper limb amputee, um, uh, whether they're above elbow or below elbow, will be resting on an armchair or on a table. And so that essentially is weight bearing. It's just not their entire body weight bearing that. So we still have some of those similar conditions within the interface. But for the most part, the lower limb has a, a good amount of weight bearing we have to deal with. And that creates much higher pressures and things like that. So I was very concerned about how well it would work. I, I can tell you that bone control being the key here, it doesn't matter if it's upper or lower limb. It works incredibly well. Um, in all manner of amputations. In fact, we have not run up against a single contraindication. I can think of a theoretical one, which is someone with a, enough HO, heterotrophic ossification, in every aspect of their limb where we can't compress anywhere. Then I, then I can call that a true contraindication for this alternating compression release scenario. However, the, um, the, the fact, the, the short answer is simply, it works equally well with upper limb and lower limb. They just have different goals in mind with that. And then would you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah, I'm just curious on how long a wear could potentially have this and you know, be in the osteostabilized state without um, experiencing limb fatigue or, or needing to take it off. I'm sure that would vary individual to individual though. It does, and, and for example, I had an athlete who wanted to win, and he said, he said to me, you know, I don't care how tight you make it, I just want to win. That was his quote to me, because he wanted to run, a, run an event. So in that instance, we made an incredibly aggressive design that, you know, eked out every last bit of, of energy we could from, from him, but you wouldn't want him wearing that on a daily basis all day long. So. Uh, we have other folks on the far end of the spectrum that wear the 16 hours a day. And what we find is some of the earlier pressure studies done were done on fingertips, which are a completely different animal in how they respond to compression. No one's really looked at large areas of longitudinal compression and looked at what numbers uh, we're dealing with. Now, we did some of this in our DARPA uh, direct to phase two. And um, what we found is there's a there's a sweet spot that we like to stay within. And um, essentially, depending on the user and their type of tissue, um, all day wear is a typical, um, is a typical scenario, not, a, not an outlier. And the reason for that is, as I said in the very beginning, we don't have to compress very much to create a biomechanical difference within the interface. And so this can vary uh, along a huge spectrum. And our goal is all day wear, no matter what, unless the patient has no desire for all day wear. So everyone we fit is intended for all day wear. I would submit to you that a traditional interface is harder on the tissues because of how they compress and where they compress and all the movement that occurs within the interface, it, it, it actually creates more damage on the limb in our mind. 
ions than something that is highly stable that moves with the structure um, and doesn't have the shear and the, and the skin issues um, that a lot of these designs do. So um, all they wear is, is, the, is a given for us. That's a great answer. Thank you. Well, we are coming up right uh, upon the 3 o'clock hour, and uh, we've had a lot of very good questions. Um, if anyone comes up with a question after the webinar, please feel free to contact us directly. Uh, we will forward that on to Randy. And Randy, thank you so very much. Uh, we also want to thank you everyone else for attending. Yes, thank you all. Appreciate it.